Can I just give you the Bible in shorthand? The Bible addresses one problem, and that problem is sin. The Bible has one villain, and that villain is the devil. The Bible has one hero, and his name is Jesus. The Bible has one purpose, and that is the glory of God. Profound Truth Simply Stated. This is Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers. You find Psalm 119. As you're finding it, look up here and let me tell you what a wise man said a long time ago. These hath God married, and no man shall part, dust on the Bible, and drought in the heart. Now, if you do not know, love, understand, practice, and obey the Word of God, I can tell you without stutter, stammer, or apology, you are not a victorious Christian. So we want to learn today how to study the Bible, how to make your Bible come alive, how to make it burst a flame in your hand. And what we're going to say today is going to be taken from this wonderful psalm, uh, Psalm 119. You know, what people need today is truth. Let me read to you a prayer from someone in Kenya. And here's the prayer. Lord, from the cowardice that dares not face new truth, from the laziness that is contented with half-truth, from the arrogance which thinks it has all truth, good Lord, deliver me. Amen. Now, I hope that you will not have cowardice this morning and be afraid of truth, that you will not have laziness and accept half-truth, or that you will not have arrogance and think that you need no truth. Friend, it is knowledge, it is truth that transforms. There was a sign in a business that said, we are not what we think we are. What we think we are. Did you understand that? We're not what we think we are, but rather what we think we are. That is, you are what you think. As a man thinketh, so is he. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs 23, verse 7. Now, if that is true, if knowledge is power, we need the knowledge of the Word of God to have spiritual power. We need to be molded, motivated, and managed by the Word of God. And yet for many, many in this congregation, <laughs> the Bible remains a closed book, a mysterious book, and uh, they really give lip service to the Bible, but they really do not understand it. Now, there's no cheap way, there's no lazy way, there's no magical way to understand the Bible. But it is not impossible. As a matter of fact, it is joyful. It is thrilling. And so we want to talk to you today about how to understand the Word of God. Now, this psalm is by far the longest psalm in the Bible, and it is what we call an acrostic. Now, an acrostic is something that starts with an arrangement of letters. This acrostic is an acrostic on the Hebrew Bible and it is divided up into sections. There are 22 stanzas, and each stanza, you, can't, you wouldn't know that by reading it in English, but each stanza starts with a letter in the Hebrew alphabet and goes through the sections, 22 sections. And each section in these 22 sections starts with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Or each verse in each of these 22 sections starts with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet. I know that's a great blessing to you, but anyway, that's true. <laughs> that is true, and uh, you would understand that there is a, there's a sort of a logical uh, arrangement here. And the writer of this uh, 119th uh, Psalm is writing to give us some statements about the Word of God. The entire Psalm. Many verses, well over a hundred verses. Each of these verses is dealing with the Word of God 
to help us to know and understand the Word of God. Now, I want to tell you three things, and there'll be some subsets under these three things, but I want to tell you three things that if you will do these things, I can promise you, and I've prayed over this, I've thought over this, if you will do these three things, I can promise you that the Bible will burst a flame in your heart, in your mind, and in your life. Number one, you must appreciate the virtues of the Word of God. Now, if you don't appreciate the virtues of the Word of God, you're not going to have any desire to learn it or know it. Many people do not understand the great value, the great virtue in the Word of God. You must have an appreciation for the Word of God. Why should you appreciate the Word of God? Number one, because it is a timeless book. Put that in your notes, a timeless book. Look, if you will, now in verse, uh, well, let's look in verse 89, for example, in this psalm. Forever, O Lord. Listen to that. Forever, O Lord. Thy word is settled in heaven. That is, the Bible is not the book of the month. It is not the book of the year. It is the book of ages. It is an unchanging book. Look, if you will, in verse 152 in this same uh, psalm. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them, what? Forever. The Bible is timeless. The Bible is ultimate. The Bible is indestructible. So we're saying that uh, we're talking of the virtues of the Word of God that you must appreciate. It's a timeless book. Number two, it is a truthful book. Do you have that? It is a truthful book. Look, if you will, in verse 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Look, if you will, in 151. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Look, if you will, in verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? <laughs> Jesus said in John chapter 17, speaking to the Father, thy word is truth. And in a world that uh, has lost its appreciation for truth, you can say without stutter or stammer that the Bible is true. Now, we have some theological experts today who think they ought to re-examine the Bible. As far as I'm concerned, we ought to re-examine them. I'm serious. Now, there are all kinds of attacks on the Bible, the, the truth of the Bible today. There's, there's just a sheer frontal attack of liberalism and the liberals who deny it. And then there's an attack from the rear, which is perhaps more insidious, and they're, they're talking about their experiences all of the time. And they're saying, well, I know what I feel or what I think. And sometimes they'll even argue with you, and they'll say, I don't care what the Bible says. And let me tell you what I experienced. <laughs> Paul had to deal with some of those in, uh, in Corinth. And Paul said to them, and put this verse down, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 37 and 38, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual. Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Uh, there were some who had gotten off into charismatic hocus-pocus in Corinth, and they'd gone wild about tongues and prophecies and visions and ecstasies, and Paul tried to set them in order. And they were saying, oh, well, let me tell you, Brother Paul, what a spiritual man I am. And let me tell you, Brother Paul, I have a gift of prophecy. Paul says, if you think you're a prophet, if you think you're spiritual, then you will acknowledge what I say is the Word of God. And then he says something almost humorous. He says, but if any man will be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Just a shrug of his shoulders. Evidently, he'd met some of these people that you and I meet around here today. There, listen, folks, there are people who want to bring the Bible under their experience. I say there is the frontal attack of the Bible by those who rail against it and deny it. There's an attack from the rear by those who want to substitute their experience for the Word of God. And then there's an, an attack from the flank, from the side. These are they who don't necessarily deny the Bible, but they kind of want to replace it. Or they want to prop it up with psychology and with um, philosophy and these other things, as if the Bible itself is not good enough 
But friend, the Bible is true, and if you're looking for truth, you can find it in the Bible. And why is this? Put this verse down, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and it says this, all Scripture, listen, all Scripture, all holy writing is given by inspiration of God. Read what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Now listen to this next phrase. By every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He was talking about the Bible. He was talking about the Bible. And he says that every word proceeds from the mouth of God. It is not simply that God breathed into the Scriptures. God breathed the Scriptures out. Yes, he used human penmen. Yes, there was Isaiah, Jeremiah. Yes, there was Matthew and Paul. Yes, there was Mark. But these men were the penmen of God. These men were the voice of God as God is speaking. Holy men of God spake as they were moved, the Bible says, by the Holy Ghost. And therefore, the Bible is true because a God of truth could not speak error. Say amen. amen. Listen, what am I saying? The Bible is a timeless book. The Bible is a truthful book, and the Bible, therefore, should be a treasured book. Look, if you will, in verse 72 of this same thing. He says here, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. I wonder if that is true of you. I'm going to tell you the truth. And God knows, God is listening to me right now. That is absolutely true of me. If you were to heap this side of this, of this platform, I mean heap it, with gold, silver, rubies, diamonds, bonds, stocks, till the goat went from floor to ceiling. And over here, put the Word of God and said, you can have one or the other. You cannot have both. I, I would not have to hesitate. I'd choose this. I would choose this. Folks, I'm telling you, this is God's treasure book. It is a timeless book. It is a truthful book. It is a treasured book. So the first point is you must, you must appreciate the virtues of the Word of God. You must appreciate the virtues of the Word of God because if you don't, you're not going to have any desire to understand it. Now, here's the second thing. Not only must you appreciate the virtues of the Word of God, you must assimilate assimilate the vitality of the Word of God. Because I chose the word vitality on purpose. Because the word vitality means alive. Now listen, the Bible is a living book. Hebrews 4.12, put it in your margin, the Word of God is quick and powerful. The word quick means alive. It is the word we get our word zoo from, or zoology from. It is zoan. And in our case, and the, uh, alive is the word we get our word energy from. It is, it is living. It is energetic. Jesus, in John chapter 6, was speaking to some unbelievers, and, and he said to them and to his disciples, listen to it, in John chapter 6, verse 63, the words that I speak unto you, listen to this, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. See, the Bible is vital. The Bible pulsates with life. Now, that's, that's the reason why I'm saying that not only must you appreciate it, you must assimilate it. <laughs> you don't just read the cookbook, you eat the meal. Now, if you don't assimilate it, no matter how much you appreciate it, what good is it going to do you? Now, how do you assimilate the Word of God? Get your pen, write these first things down. Number one, write down, pray over it. Pray over it. Look, if you will, in verse 73 of this same psalm. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. How often? In sermon preparation, have I put my pencil down? Have I bowed my head and said, oh my God, help me to understand this. God, give me understanding. Now, all of this is under the heading we must pray over. We must pray over. When we pray, when we pray, friend, our eyes are open, 
our heart is moved, our mind is enlightened to understand the Word of God. So, uh, now we're talking now about how to assimilate it. Number one, you pray over it. Number two, you ponder it. P-O-N-D-E-R. You ponder it. Look, if you will, in verse 15 of this same psalm, I will meditate in thy precepts. Do you see that? Look, if you will, in verse 147 of this same psalm, I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried, and I hoped in thy word. That is, I got up early in the morning, and I trusted it in your word. That is, I had a quiet time. Look, if you will, in uh, verse 48, 148, mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. You see, it takes time. If you have to rise an hour early, do it. If you have to stay up an hour late, do it. Uh, that, you might, that you might just ponder the word of God. I have given you this before, but I want to give you six questions. You ask these six questions. Now get your pencil and write these six questions down. My wife says, you always go too fast when you say these. Number one, is there a promise to claim? You're looking at a passage. Is there a promise to claim? Number two, is there a lesson to learn? Number three, is there a blessing to enjoy? Number four, is there a command to obey? Number five, is there a sin to avoid? Number six, is there a new thought to carry with me? Are you preparing a Sunday school lesson? Get any passage of Scripture, any passage, and just look at it and just ask those questions and you've got your lesson. I promise you. Just six simple questions as you look at the Word of God. You've prayed over it and you've said, Oh God, open my eyes. you said, Dear God, move my heart. you said, Dear God, give me understanding. And then you look at the Word of God and you ponder it, and you think about it, and you've got a pen, and you write these things down. You read it through. You think it clear. You write it down. You pray it in. You live it out, and you pass it on, and it's yours. It's yours. You say, I can't remember all that. Okay, get the tape, because we've got to move on. <laughs> Number one, uh, you pray over it. Number two, you ponder it. Number three, you preserve it. You preserve it. Look, if you will, here in verse 11. We're back in our psalm again. Look, if you will, in verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, look, if you will, in verse 16. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. That means that you, you, you preserve it, you hide it down in your heart. You can remember far more than you think you can remember. Now next, and I don't have time for that because uh, we must rush on. Not only must you preserve it, you must, here's the fourth thing, you must practice it. Look, if you will, in the first four verses. Uh, Psalm 119, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with a whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. It's not enough to rec recite the promises without obeying the commandments. Simple secret. Do you want to learn more of the Word of God? Do you? Then obey the part you know. That is so simple. The Bible says, To him that hath shall be given. The rich get richer. The more you obey, the more you learn it. <laughs> but let, keep the Word of God. You say, well, there's a lot of the Bible I don't understand. Do you know what Mark Twain is reported to have said? He's reported to have said, it's not that part of the Bible that I don't understand that gives me so much trouble. It's the part I do understand. Huh? Okay. Now, listen, there may be mysteries and things you don't understand about the third toe on the left foot of some beast in Revelation. But I tell you, you can't understand when the Bible says love one another, can't you? You can't understand when the Bible gives you clear and plain commandments 
And if you will begin to keep these, uh, the Word of God, uh, it will become real to you. No, next, uh, you must, you must proclaim it. This is the fifth of these things you do if you were, are going to assimilate it. Look, if you will, in verse 13. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. With my lips. Look in verse 27. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts, so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. Look, if you will, in verse 46. I will speak of thy testimony also before kings and will not be ashamed. Look, if you will, in verse 172 of this um, same psalm here. My tongue shall speak of, of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteous. You see, give it away. Let the word of God be in your mouth, constantly in your mouth. Stow it in your heart. Show it in your life. Sow it in the world. The more of the word of God you give away, the more of it will stick to you. Now, here I've got to move to the final thing. Look, what we said is this. You must appreciate the virtues of the word of God. Number two, you must assimilate the vitality of the word of God. And number three, it is then that you can appropriate the values of the word of God. That is, that, that this, this knowledge that you have is going to become a, a, a transformational. I'm just going to give you the outline. I can't fill in the points. And you just write them down. Number one, it'll be a source of victory. Verse 45. Just as Jesus overcame Satan in the wilderness with the word, you will overcome. It will be a source of growth. Verse 32. <laughs> People say, oh, Pastor, I'm just so weak in my physical life. I can just hardly get out of bed. I just don't want to go to work. I'm just so weak. I say, well, what's the matter with you? You been to the doctor? No. You got a disease? I don't think so. Well, good Lord, man, what are you eating? Well, I have this restaurant I go to on Sunday sometimes. It's not raining, and I, I get a meal there. That's all I eat. You mean that's all you eat? You just go to this restaurant on Sunday, and you get a meal there if it's not raining? That's all you eat? Yeah, I'm just so weak. <laughs> Friend, listen. All this is, is just to whet your appetite. If you don't learn how to feed yourself the Word of God, you're not going to grow. The Bible says that as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. It's a source of growth. It's a source of joy. Verses 54 and 111. I don't have time to talk about that. But these things have I spoken unto you that your joy might be full. It's a source of power. The Word of God is quick and powerful. It's a source of guidance. Well, let's give you one for the power. Verse 28. It's a source of guidance. Verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. <laughs> the word of God, the word of God, it will give you all of these things. You want joy, you want power, you want victory, you want to be able to overcome, you want these wonderful things you can appropriate them, but you can only appropriate them after you assimilate them. And you can only assimilate them if you appreciate them. And I'm promising you that if you'll do that, it will be transformational in your life. Now, could we just sum up the Bible right now for those of you who are not Christians or maybe you've never been saved? Can I just give you the Bible in shorthand? The Bible addresses one problem. And that problem is sin. The Bible has one villain, and that villain is the devil. The Bible has one hero, and his name is Jesus. The Bible has one purpose, and that is the glory of God. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him? You see, this book is a two-edged sword. If it doesn't cut to heal you, it will cut to slay you. It's a savor of life unto life or death unto death. And God wants me to tell you something today that's going to come right out of this book. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that means you, that whosoever, that means anyone, believes in him, 
puts their faith, their trust in Him, they will not perish. They will not die and go to hell. They will not. But they'll have everlasting life. That's what we sing about. We sing about heaven. A few more days and we're passing on. Do you know Jesus?